Everywhere I go, I find hurting people. I find hurting people everywhere. And I mean, you know, they've been hurt by people. They've been hurt by life. They've been hurt by situations. And, it, and when you look in their eyes, the only thing you see there is the hurt that's there. And you sit down and you go to talk to them. And, and what do we have to give people other than the Word of God? Is there anything more powerful than the Word of God? Is there anything that is more comforting or soothing rather than the Word of God? My concept, my ideology, my ideas might sound good to me, but they don't help, literally help people on where they are and what they're trying to do. People that are sick, I tell them Jesus is a healer. Now, is everybody healed? No, and, and I don't understand that. I have been instantaneously, miraculously healed in my life, but not everybody receives that, and I don't know why. And one of these days in the sweet by and by, I'm going to ask God, why? And you know what? If I know God, God's got a logical reason behind it, and it will make sense then even though it don't now. To me, I would love to see everybody healed. I'd love to see utopia on planet Earth. I would love to see everybody healthy, wealthy, wise, fed, sheltered, clothed. But you know what? That might be my vision and my goal, but I've not seen it yet. So either we've got the choice to back up and say, this needs to be done, or we do what we can where we can do it, and however we can do it. If you've got your Bibles this morning, I want you to go with me into St. Matthew's Gospel, 17th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel. And, you know, a few weeks ago, uh, uh, I used this, this text on speaking to your mountains. And, you know, that if there's ever a time we need to do that is now. Our mountains are talking to us, but I want to bring it in just a little bit different flavor this morning. Because of the simple fact that if we recognize there is a mountain before us, if we recognize that there's a problem we need to face, then what do we do with it? What do we do with the mountains in our lives? Do we stand back and curse the mountain? It's not what God said to do. He said, speak to that mountain. What about the problems in our lives? Do we get mad, upset because of a problem in our life? Or do we speak to that problem and bring it under subjection to the name of Jesus Christ? You see, one is faith and one is fear. The faith is when we believe God is able. The fear is when we believe that that mountain is greater than we are and greater than our God. And folks, I've got news for you. That's a lie. Because the lie is nothing is greater than our God. And that's the truth of the situation. The lie comes in when that mountain exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So this morning as we begin to look at this, you know, speaking to our mountains... When we come to that place that we understand that our words have power when our words align with the Word of God. We are no longer speaking our mind or our ideas or our concepts or ideology, but rather we are speaking what God said to speak. And when we understand that, then all of a sudden the world doesn't look as bad. When we understand that God give us the words to say, David said this, I will hide thy word in my heart that I won't sin against you. What are we putting in our heart today? The Bible says, For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. What's coming out of our lips? Our lips is an indicator of what is really within us. When we begin to understand you know, we've got a, a terminology in computers, garbage in, garbage out. Good in, good out. Is good coming out or is garbage coming out? And that will be a true indicator of what we are placing in our heart and what it's full of. 
Have you ever met people that's got anger in their heart? They are mad. They're mad at the world. They're mad at everybody. They're mad at every situation. Every person that comes by them, they will give them a piece of their mind. And the sad part about it is, many of us don't have enough mind to give away. We need all we've got, and then some. But you know, when we, when we look at, at speaking to our mountains, then we come to the place, where do I fit in this? Where do I really fit in this? What is my goal? What is my purpose? What is my reason to exist? Why am I here? See, a lot of you think that you are here just maybe not knowing why, but I'll tell you why you're here. You're here to promote the kingdom of God. You're here to live in the kingdom of God. You're here to portray what God wants you to be the witness to everybody around you. And you know, that's what brings us down to what we're looking at today. Matthew 17 says this in 14, talking about our mountains. But you know, I'm not going to repeat that and go over that. That was a few weeks ago. But I want you to go to Matthew 11. I'm going to start in verse 7 because it all ties together. What are we speaking to in our life? And what are we letting our life become? How many of you know that if we live in fear, then we become fearful of everything and everybody? If we live our life in unbelief, then we don't trust anybody. And we trust nobody. And if we live our life in faith, then what happens is people see that faith within us. Please stand this morning for the reading of God's Word. Matthew chapter 11, starting verse 7. And as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitude concerning John, What went ye out in the wilderness to see a reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see a man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. But what went ye out to see? A prophet. Yea, I say unto you, more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist unto now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesy unto John, and if you will receive it, this is a lie which was for to come, for he that hath ears, let him hear. Ears to hear, let him hear. There are two types of sticks in the world, and I'm going to stop right here. Because we've got to understand something. John is talking about, uh, God is talking about John, or Jesus is talking about John, and asking people, what are we really expecting to see in him? And when we begin to understand that every one of us falls into one category or the other, Jesus dealt in absolutes, either saved or lost, healed or sick. You know, delivered or oppressed. We today want to categorize and bring it into gradient, gradients or a small ratio. Am I more sick than I am healed? Or am I more healed than I am sick? Am I more saved than I am lost? Or am I more lost than I'm saved? The thing we need to do is come back where Jesus is talking about. And this brings us down to the scenario of the day. What did Jesus go out to see? And he asked his disciples, did you go out to see a reed shaken by the wind? And this comes down, how many of you know what a reed is, by the way? Before we get any farther, reed is a type of a plant that has a stick in it. It's got a, a, a shaft 
or a central part that holds the leaves, a stem if you want to call it that. But when we begin to look at what does Jesus say about John? What did you go out there to see? What were you looking for? What were you really wanting to see? You know, that's a question we need to talk about today. What are we really expecting to see? What are we wanting to see? Most people that I meet today are either one of two things. Either they're hurting or they're okay. And the thing I need to tell you is this, I find more hurting people than I do anybody else. I found people that's been hurt by life. I find people that are bitter. I find people that are discouraged. I find people that have no hope within them. And when you look in the eyes of a person without hope, the old saying, the lights are on, but there ain't nobody home. There's no joy there. There's no fulfillment there. There is no, what I call, reason to exist. And therefore, depression comes. But today, I want to tell you something. Jesus kind of surmised it up into sticks. And we got two types of sticks that you're dealing with. One is shaken. One is bent. One is broken. And Jesus begins to talk about John the Baptist. Why would a reed, a reed be shaken because of the wind? John did not bow down or did not bend or back up or bow over to the words of Herod. You see, the thing about it is, our lives are full of decisions every day of our life. You got two types of sticks. You got those that are straight, those that are bent, and you also got those that are broken as the second type. What's Jesus talking about here in talking about John the Baptist? First of all, he says this, John the Baptist is a great man, greatest man born of woman. But the, he is, even the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist when it comes down to what the potential within us is. The Bible talked about unto John, they prophesied that the kingdom of God would come. John declared and Jesus declared that the kingdom of God is at hand and is here and is now and therefore we're not looking for it, future tense. Today I'm going to ask you something. What does it mean to be in the kingdom of God? Kingdom of God is a, a type of social order that's got one king. Our one king is Jesus Christ, the holy son of God, the righteous the great I am, the first and the last, the beginning, the Alpha, the Omega. He is everything in that leadership. Well, where do we fit in? The real question is, where do we fit in in Christ? In Christ, are we looking for Him to be the author and the finisher of our faith? Or are we looking for Him to be something in the future that He might not be for us yet? In the Jewish faith, they're looking for Jesus to come back as the Messiah, the Deliverer, the one that delivers Israel. And yes, He'll do that. But to the Gentiles, He's already delivered us. He's delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and translated us into His own kingdom. But you know what? Sometimes we don't act that way. Sometimes we don't act that way for the simple fact we don't know who we belong to. We've got a saying here in the mountains, who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Do you know what that really means is? Who lays claim to you and who do you claim? And Clyde, I need to change microphones. Give me orange if you would. How's that? Battery died. Isn't technology great? Technology is great until it quits. But you know what? With technology today, we can stand today and declare the Word of God in Prestonsburg, Kentucky, and around the world, people listen to the words that we say. Clyde, I need for you to check the streaming back there and the headsets and make sure this microphone is coming through it. When we begin to understand that everything that we do has got a purpose, 
Every person in the kingdom of God has got a purpose and a plan for being there. The main problem is we don't understand our purpose or our plan. What is our plan? What is our game plan? What are we going to do? Where are we going? What is next in our life? And the sad part about it is sometimes if we don't know, then how are we going to fulfill the plan that we were called to do? Jesus talks about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was one not shaken by public opinion. How many of you know that public opinion against the church today is changing and the United States of America is trying their best to come against the Christian faith? But I've got news for you. I've got news for you. Even in our preamble, it talks about one nation under God and indivisible, the pledge of our allegiance. I believe this, that we will not bow to peer pressure as true men and women of God. I believe that they will not silence our voice. They will not come and say, if you will no longer mention this name, we'll let you go and do your own thing. But folks, I've got news for you. The best defense is a good offense. What are we doing? I believe this, that if we can conquer the kingdom of darkness in America, that we will be one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our problem is, we are not taking the fight to the enemy. We are reactive to what comes our way rather than taking it to the enemy. Today I'm going to ask you something. If Jesus was to speak about us, if Jesus was to speak about Paul Aiken, how would he relate me? Would he relate to me as one that stands straight even in the voice of opposition? Or does he look at me and say, well, he's one going to and fro, to and fro. Whatever is around me is the way I'm bending and swaying. The sad part about it is, I'm afraid that a lot of the kingdom of God is that way. Our problem is we don't have the backbone that Jesus said we should have. We don't have the mission that Jesus says that we should have. We don't have the audacity to believe the word of God when everything else is falling apart. But Jesus says we can do that. When you begin to look at what uh, the Bible talks about Jesus in the book of Isaiah. He's talking about in there that he will not break a bruised reed. He will not destroy what is already damaged. And the thing about it is what we need in the church today is more compassion. What we need in the church today is a more want to help, want to hold up, want to encourage than discourage and talk down about all the things around us. You know, the thing about it is, people's not perfect. If you're looking for perfection in me, you've come to the wrong place. Look to the cross. The only man that has been perfect on planet Earth is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, born to the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, and then on the third day arose and is seated in to the majesty, right hand of the majesty of God. That is perfection. Don't look for perfection in the church today, in the lives of people around you today, because you will be discouraged everywhere you go and every time you look at a person. Even Adam, that was formed in the image of God, that was given wisdom beyond the, the capacity of man, was given everything that you can think of. Even Adam fell when he failed to believe what God had told him. What about us? What are we looking for today? Are we looking for perfection in man? Or are we looking for perfection in God? When we sat down and look at everything coming and going our way, it's easy to get discouraged. It's easy when troubles come. But I've got news for you. I've got a slogan. It's been a slogan of my life for probably going on 30 years. When troubles may come my way, I lift my voice high and say, Well, hallelujah, anyway. 
When the enemy wants to silence you is the time to proclaim it from the rooftops. When it looks like there's no way out, declare to the mountain you will not stop me from what God's called me to do. And you know what? Isn't it funny how that things seem to get better when we get the right attitude in God? And we leave that attitude, woe is me. If God really loved me, would I be going through this? And it comes down to what the devil told Jesus. He said, if you be the son of God, command these stones that they be made bread. And the thing we've got to understand is, how many times has he come to us and say, if you be a child of God, why are you going through this hardship and heartache and trouble? And yeah, like everybody else, every now and then I go on my own pity party. Oh God, nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I think I'll just go eat worms. And the thing about it is, where does that put us? Where does it put us when we're in discouragement? Where does the light of Jesus Christ shine when we can't smile at a person because we're going through something? Where does that put us when we're hurting and another hurting individual comes to us? And are we going to say, gloom, despair, and agony on me? Whoa! Deep, dark depression. Excessive misery. Whoa! Let me tell you something. You let a hurting individual come and you got that attitude, they're going to back up and say, well, I'm in better shape than they are. But where is the glory of God in our life? The glory of God comes in to when there is no way that we see and God makes a way. Jesus said, I am the door. How many of you know that every now and then we need a door in the walls of our life? Sometimes we've prayed against the walls long enough. Now let's build the door in there rather than walk around those walls. You look at what Jesus told Peter in the 13th chapter of Matthew. When, when Jesus asked Peter, Peter, who do you say that I am? He says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon. For flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And the thing about it is, we need to move in our life on the revelation knowledge of Almighty God. Not what man says, not what people around you say, not what the general consensus is, but what saith the Spirit of God. And let me tell you something right now. When we walk after the Spirit, the Bible says we won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. How many times in our lives do we really need to stop and look? I tell everybody this. I've got to take times in my life. I stack back up and look at me. Am I fulfilling the mission that God's called me to do? You know, Suzanne mentioned earlier about going to the flea market. If it's not 10 degrees or lower, I'm planning on being at the flea market next weekend. What am I going to be doing? I'm going to be there praying for people. Well, that ain't got nothing to do with the church. It ain't got nothing to do with the church. It's called the kingdom of God. Where I am, the kingdom of God is there. Jesus said the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost comes within us and makes their abode within us. Where I am, they are there also. And that will preach, folks. Taking God with you wherever you go. Don't take him to the hell holes of the world. Take him to the place to where that God can shine the brightest. And yes, I have gone into the bars and witnessed. And yes, I've gone to the red light districts of, of cities and witnessed. Yes, I've gone to the winos and sat on the corner with them and witnessed. Taking the gospel. Because the word gospel means good news. Good news is you don't have to live this way anymore. The good news is you're above this if you'll only accept him. 
The good news is Jesus come and died for you that you could have life and have it more abundantly. The good news is that, that you know, you don't have to deal with the things you've dealt with in your past. Every one of us has got a past of one type or the other, good, bad, or ugly, but the past is a past. Now let's look towards the future. What's the future of this church? Future of this church is blessed. Future of this church is glorious. Future of this church is successful. The future of this church is we are going to bring people into the kingdom of God and that's all that really matters. It don't matter about the building. I praise God for this building. I'm warm in here today. I am dry in here today. I am comfortable in here today. But it's not about in here. It's about out there because people are dying every day. And I am I so oriented for comfort that I no longer want to help the suffering. In Detroit, the, back in the turn of the century, at the Detroit River was so polluted with all of the all of the the slaughterhouses, all of the sewers, and everything else. There's a story of a man that fell off of the bridge and went in the water, and they got him out of the water, but he swallowed a lot of the river water and its pollution. And they looked down at him and they said, Will he live? And the doctor that was taking care of him said, if we can get the water out of him, get the pollution out of him, get all the things that's going to defile him and kill him out of him, then he will live. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. We need to do that with the people around us today. Get it out of them. How do we get it out of them? With the word of God in the name of Jesus. Today I want to encourage you. I never like to close a service unless we offer an invitation. And this invitation is maybe you're discouraged today. Maybe, you're, maybe it's been one of them weeks that every demon in hell has been at your back door or your, your bedroom door or whatever that when you get out of bed in the morning, the battle is on. And I got news for you. If you will allow him, that will happen. The thing we need to understand is greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Greater. Do you know what that means? That don't mean equal to. That don't mean almost as strong. That means greater, more than enough. Whatever you're battling, the strength of your enemy, God is greater. Now, take joy and faith in what God has done. Let us all stand this morning and let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come today in the mighty name of Jesus. We come exalting you in the tabernacle this morning. Lord, you are Lord and besides you there's none other. You are the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. You are my healer and my deliverer. You are my, my Savior, my Lord and my God. And I refuse to bend at oppression. I refuse to bow at persecution. I refuse to bow when the tongues of the enemy is lashing out against me. Lord, let us stand straight in the name of Jesus. Let us stand with our head lifted high. Lord, with our hands towards heaven, giving you praise, honor, and glory. Because you're worthy. You're worthy. It's not about me, Lord. It's about you. You're worthy, Lord, to receive all glory, honor, and praise. You're worthy, Lord, to be nominated King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You're worthy, Lord, to be declared the Son of God in glory. You're worthy, Lord, and we thank you that you dwell within us. We will ourselves to you, O God. Our voice becomes your voice. Our hands become your hands. Lord, let your heart become our heart and your mind our mind. Lord, let us fulfill what you've called us to do. And today we declare that you are exalted 
in the tabernacle today and in the days of our lives. For it's in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. If there's a need in your life today, I invite you to come. I invite you to come. If you don't want to come up here, just, just stand where you are. Just raise your hands. If there's a need in your life, just stand where you are and raise your hands. Anymore. I want the people that don't have their hands raised to extend your hands towards these that are. Hold your hands up there. Now I want everybody to extend your hand and I want you to begin praying for the people that's got their hands up right now. I want you to declare the mountains in their life be torn down. I want you to call the blessing of God from on high and from within out to them that they be lifted up. And I want you to declare the voice of victory that more than conquerors are you in Christ Jesus. More than just enough is Jesus in their life. More than barely getting through, but He's a God of abundance. He's the God of, of, of plenty. And we praise you today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Remember, our service starts this evening at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then come in in there. Okay, can as long as as long as somebody will print them out, we're going to pray for them this evening. Okay. Amen. Amen. We're praying for the fulfillment. Yes. Amen. Amen. We're believing God. Anybody else? Invite everybody that wants to come tonight and be here in person. Invite them to come out. What's God going to do? God's going to be God in the tabernacle tonight. And we're going to give him praise for what he's done. We're not going to dismiss today because we're going to say go in peace. And God bless each and every one of you and we'll see you tonight, 6 p.m. here at the Tabernacle. God bless each and every one of you.